Greetings and thanks for tuning in. I'm Don Taylor from Main Street Middle School in Montpelier and w welcome to the fourth episode of our PLP Pathways Professional Development Series. I'd like to thank Orca Media for letting us film the show in their studio. My co-hosts. Hi, I'm Maura Kelly. I teach humanities at People's Academy Middle Level in Morrisville, Vermont. In our last episode, we discussed student-led conferences, revising goals, and what we've learned so far from the first cycle of goal setting and revision in the PLP implementation uh, cycle. Before we get into today's show, we want to make sure you know how to stay connected to PLP Pathways. You can visit our site, follow us on Twitter, and keep tabs on the project through our blog. We'll show you these again at the end of our show. Every month, we also host a YouTube live event for Vermont educators. Uh, this this pre-recorded segment that you're watching now will lead to online discussion, collaboration, and planning among interested, edu interested educators. Uh, videos are posted on the PLP Pathways YouTube channel, and you can reach out to myself or Mora if you'd actually like a seat at the table and mm -hmm. to join that discussion live. So as part of today's program, I'd like to review the personal learning framework We've introduced this before, but now is a good time to talk about where we are in that process and to identify some of the ways that we're exploring different elements of that framework. Uh, students are currently in the growth and reflection stage. That is, uh, for our new students, we've learned a lot about them, their strengths and challenges. We've also developed expectations for our learning community. And as in our first trimester, we set goals with those students We've had conferences where we went over those goals, we've identified progress, we've also talked about how they can be demonstrating their proficiencies, not only in class, but in their extracurricular activities and outside the school. Uh, so as part of that growth and reflection, we're now uh, deciding, hey, uh, we've, we've revised our goals, uh, where are we headed next? How can we be revisiting these goals on a regular basis and encouraging kids to continue developing the skills to tie evidence uh, to their goals? And I think that's really where we want to focus is continually developing these cycles of here's my goal, here's evidence, and how does this evidence of proficiency meet my goals? And Maura, how are you as a team working with the goals, with that framework, and what does it look like in your classroom now? So um, right now, one of the things that we're really trying to figure out, um, our schedule has changed a bunch this year, and so we're really trying to figure out what are our routines that we're going to establish that we're going to put in place for students to um, sort of curate their evidence and reflect on those goals? So right now we have um, a few sort of short blocks during the, the school week where we have students, um, they can use a bank of reflection questions or just have a regular um, sort of stream of consciousness reflection. Um, and so we're trying to build in some times for them to do that. Um, we're also using time within our TAs. Um, we have time with our advisory students, both in the morning and then again at the afternoon. And so trying to f sort of make time there to sit down and have um, student to student conferences. On Fridays, we have extended TAs. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we go over progress reports with students. We talk to them about their goals. And we also schedule them for what we call academic time, um, which is a 20 minute, 25 minute block every morning. And so we take some time to schedule them to different adults throughout the building to either help them um, work on an area of academics or work on a goal. And so that's sort of the time that we're scheduling them. In terms of some totals of time per week, how often would you say your kids are working on their PLPs, working on uh, creating goals and working on collecting evidence? I would say right now, um, we're, as of this week, um, we probably will have worked on it twice mm -hmm. this week. Um, mm -hmm. But the hope is that, you know, given the routines, it will have to be, it will become less teacher directed. And so students will be able to sort of work more independently um, within those given times. So that leads nicely into our next uh, segment of the show, which is to talk about uh, exploration and mm -hmm. flexible pathways. But I do want to go back. You were talking about reflection, and we've, also, we've often uh, discussed how important reflection is mm -hmm. to the whole process. Are your kids blogging, or how are they uh, reflecting, and what kind of structures do you have for the actual mm -hmm. writing and reflection and demonstration of their learning? So this year, um, we have been using Blogger for mm -hmm. a few years now. And um, you know, I think one of the, the 
benefits, but also the challenges to having um, iPads in the classroom is that the Blogger app went away over the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, Apple iOS doesn't support a uh, Blogger app, and so we're using sort of a different platform to publish things onto students' blogs, but it definitely has changed um, how students are accessing their, their blogs this year. Uh, we're also using blogs, and I found blogs to be a critical tool for our uh, classroom and for our students. And if I wasn't using Blogger, I'd be using something else. I just think they're so valuable. Mm -hmm. And one of the exercises that we do pretty regularly is to have kids simply read through their blogs. And even over the course of a month, they can see the changes in their learning and the different uh, strengths and challenges that they've overcome. And I just think it's a really powerful tool. Uh, we also mentioned, <clears throat> as you discussed, uh, having uh, with kids and iPads and computers having uh, this exploration or these flexible pathways mm -hmm. that they can um, that they can start exploring when they're done say with the primary task of the day and uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, that exploration and what that looks like in your classroom so one of the things that we've been talking about is exploration and what does exploration look like in my classroom. And this is something that I've developed probably over the last couple of years. And uh, we started out talking to kids about exploring careers and colleges, but we found that for adolescents and middle mm -hmm. level kids, sometimes that's, uh, that horizon is too distant. So one of the things that we've really started to do is to provide students with opportunities to explore local, oppor uh, local options. And that starts with camps, that starts with places, that starts with schools or sites of activities that they're currently engaged in. And this year, one of the things that we've done on our exploration page is to insert a Google map. So each kid has a Google map, and we've started out by putting uh, just different places that they're visiting. But then as we expand that, we also start to look at options that they might have for vacations, for uh, the summer activities. For example, we have lots of kids who are interested in sports. So we'll have them go out there and find what sport camps are available to you. We'll have them plot that on the map, and then they'll go to the website. They'll put the website information on that point. And in that way, we just have kids starting to explore some of the different options that are available to them. And given a little bit of extra time, they can do that. They're using the map. It's uh, a geographical tool. And we just really think that that is a benefit to kids to allow them some time and some freedom to explore some of the different opportunities that are out there. And now you have something called opportunity time. We do. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So one of the shifts that we made at a school as a school building, fifth through eighth grade, is um, we used to have what were called experts. And they were electives that teachers um, picked topics that they either were interested in or what we would consider ourselves skilled at and we would create expert classes and students would you know register for them over the summer and then be scheduled for the year based on the teacher and you know what part of act 77 is that the student really is the driver and the student is the one that's sort of d making some decisions and finding opportunities so this year instead of having um, experts we have created what's called opportunity time and so it's a 40 minute block at the end of the day and every student has an opportunity time. It looks a little different um, at the different grade levels, fifth and sixth grade. They started by going through a rotation of um, different potential opportunities they might want to explore. They also did a lot of work with growth mindset um, and from their personal goal setting, teachers have broken them into sort of like-minded groups and have been facilitating them um, in explorations of all different things. So there's you know, a group of students who are working on coding and robotics, and it, it really came out of their personal goal setting. Within my team, um, we use a negotiated curriculum framework to derive a team theme. Um, and our team theme this year is creativity. Uh, that's what the students came up with, going through this process um, where we've had a lot of help um, by Lindsay Hallman at the mm -hmm. Edge Academy. And so um, for our team now, students have created some project ideas. So they've sort of done some questioning and developed an inquiry question. And this is a time of day that they're working through their projects. 
Um, and they're also connecting. One of the things that we're really focusing on this year is trying to connect students to either community mentors, either within our school building or within our local community, and try and find options for um, partnerships that way. So would you consider this opportunity time, are you considering that a flexible pathway? Because we haven't really talked about flexible pathways too much, and I was wondering how you fit this into the context of our three pillars of personalized learning. Yeah, I think for us, our hope is really that it, it becomes truly a flexible pathway. Um, I think, you know, we, we're in the beginning stages of having it work, but as a building, we're really hoping that we can be connecting students with mentors, maybe getting students out of the building, into the community, doing some uh, really thoughtful work, um, having students identify areas that they want to work on and that they're passionate about and trying to help them sort of hone in those skills and really take some time for exploration. And so, and we're also hoping, you know, this is a time where we do have some students taking coursework. Like I have eighth grade students who are taking high school classes at this time. And it's an opportunity because it's built into their schedule. And so it, it frees up some students to really have the option right. uh, to do that work. And I think that's something that we need to talk more about on this show and in our webinar is the structuring of those flexible pathways. Because some of the things that I heard you say is that all students have this time, <laughs> that all students have these opportunities, that there's a theme that all students can become engaged in. And to me, a, a lot of the issue with flexible pathways is the equity of opportunity. And I haven't quite developed a language around it yet, but I'm considering uh, internal flexible pathways mm -hmm. and external flexible pathways. So an internal one to me is one that's created within the school or within the team or within the program that all kids have the opportunities uh, to experience. And I think that's really important, especially at the middle level, mm -hmm. so that they can use those as stepping stones to go out in the community. But I think it's essential that all kids get that chance to explore in a flexible pathway that's structured for them so they don't have to do so much of the organizing because that can be a barrier to right. engagement. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. And again, uh, the flexible pathways is really the third pillar along with proficiency-based learning and uh, personalized learning that makes up the three pillars of personalized learning. Uh, and that model's been developed by the Tarrant Institute and the Middle Grades Collaborative. Uh, we'd like to thank you again for watching. It sounds like uh, we need to talk more about the flexible pathways. Mm -hmm. And before we end tonight's show, another topic that we really need to cover is digital citizenship. And we've talked a little bit about that, but uh, digital citizenship is essential mm -hmm. for all of you educators using, um, using technology in the classroom. And we're not going to go too deep into it tonight, but for in your class, Maura, what are the steps you take to make sure that your kids are using the technology appropriately and uh, following some expectations around digital citizenship? So we start every year um, with a focus on um, digital citizenship. So um, we use the Common Sense Media scope and sequence around mm -hmm. digital citizenship. And we look at the big themes that they have um, such as online safety, identity, um, cyberbullying, and we design lessons to uh, teach our students. And so we do a rotation sort of within our team where we know that students have been exposed to those main topics. Um, we also then send home, we're actually sending home this week, uh, what we call a family media agreement. And this is a contract almost between students and parents about how students are gonna be utilizing the technology. And we also give parents a lot of resources. And it just opens up sort of the op opportunity for parents and kids to sit down, talk about how they're using the technology in school, talk about what the expectations are, also to set up a framework within the house about care and maintenance of the iPad um, as it's going home. And students and parents um, sign that and um, also create a video responding to some of those questions um, and really just have a conversation about digital citizenship at home because um, we really identify this time of year as a time that we need to revisit. Right. And then again, um, when we come back in February from February break, we do a digital citizenship boot camp. So the first day back from school, yeah. um, we go back through and we do other lessons and really targeted um, instruction around digital citizenship. But I also think it goes to how, uh, when we're setting the intentions within the classroom um, and we're talking about it at TA and talking about it within the classroom and having conversations with students and finding those 
sort of learning moments that we, we can have within the classroom. Yeah, I think just listening to you talk about it, it makes, it's a re good reminder to me that you, I don't think you can ever teach digital citizenship too much. Mm -hmm. And some of the structures that you have in place, the boot camps and those rotations sound like things that I should probably think about in my own classroom. We talk a lot about digital footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, we also use uh, common sense media. We also use examples, real examples, uh, to show how people are putting their best foot forward uh, online. And I just think in this day and age, it's critical that we're all considering digital citizenship and creating expectations for our team. Uh, I think that's it for tonight. I'd like to thank everybody for watching again. Uh, PLP Pathways is a teacher-driven, uh, teacher-supported uh, professional learning network that's designed to help all those folks out there who are implementing Act 77. Um, please visit us online at PLP Pathways. You can visit our web or follow us on Twitter. I would also like to remind you again that there will be um, the Middle Grades Conference, which is happening on January 7th, 2017. Uh, you can find out more information on that at the Middle Grades Collaborative website, as well as information about the Middle Grades Institute, which is happening in June of 2017. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and we appreciate it, and we'll see you next time.